implementation. Ozone Action is offering this forum to promote ozone layer protection through the use of modern electronic communication technologies to increase global online learning and knowledge sharing. Before we start uh, the webinar, let me first provide you with few details. Um, uh, first, we will be together for approximately one uh, hour and a uh, half, approximately nine min 90 minutes. And for the duration of the webinar, all the microphones will be muted to avoid background sounds. Mm -hmm. However, should you like to raise a question at any time for the duration of the webinar, please feel free to do so. You can type your question directly into the chat box mm -hmm. that is on the right side at the bottom of the control panel. Please kindly indicate your name and your organization and or country. During this webinar, we will have four presentations and we will allocate enough time to allow for question and answer. Also, if time permits, we will unmute the microphones to invite participants who wish to do so to pose their questions directly using the audio. I am pleased now to invite Ms. Artie Dubry. Ms. Artie Dubry is the Regional Network Coordinator for the Pacific Islands in Ozone Action UNEP Compliance Assistance Program Regional Office for Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. Ms. Dubry will introduce today's webinar topic and tell us about the role of national ozone officers in addressing the subject of standards for the adoption of HCFC alternatives. I don't think anyone can explain it because no. Okay. Arti, we are listening to you. Thank you. Yes, I confirm we can see your yes. presentation. Can you go to full mode, uh, full screen mode, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, good evening and good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to be with us at this session. Um, as for the topic of my session, it's a, an introductory uh, session on the roles of national ocean officers in addressing the subject of standards uh, you uh, to you manage your implementation no, to longer term. Uh, uh, okay. Now, the question is that why should our national ocean officers be engaged in the business of standards? And the, uh, going back to the decisions of the parties, as well as the, the mechanisms uh, that are being used for addressing the issues of out continually at the international level, and we completed the meeting of the Britain and the third meeting, okay. to be followed uh, by a weekend event on the Bangkok Technology Meeting. And throughout these sessions, uh, there's always the, the the, the outreach to engage standards as a mechanism to assist our countries in the uh, implementation or the adaptation to longer term alternatives. So I just take these uh, these few key decision points that that can help you in in given policy uh, directives and policy approaches to your national implementation procedures. So we have a uh, decision uh, 96 of the Montreal Protocol that uh, led to the acceleration of, or took the decision, sorry, on the acceleration of HCFC. Uh, from this decision, uh, we have uh, as a phase out of HCFC progresses our Article 5 countries, which are primarily our developing countries, to give an opportunity to focus it on the adaptation to longer term alternatives with the added benefit of course of climate impact. Also following decisions of, of the parties, it, uh, as a technical and economic assessment panel, the call to describe all alternatives to ozone depleting substances that are commercially available, technically proven, environmentally sound, and take into account the efficacy, health, safety, and environmental characteristics. So this is, these are very strong guiding words from the technical and economic assessment panel of the Montreal Protocol on what is being required as we address the technology adaptation processes in the, our phase-out mandate of the Montreal Protocol. 
Out of the five countries implement national plans for the phasing out of HCFCs under the Montreal Protocol, countries are facing growing demand to introduce the implementation net and implement mechanisms to ensure that a range of efficient plans are fully supported at a national level and move towards more climate-friendly refrigerant alternatives and, of course, considerations have, have to be given to the energy efficiency of these uh, newer technologies. So what we are hoping to achieve from, these, uh, from this webinar session is that to bring the subject to a point of discussion and for us to start talking about what is really needed and why and the how. So I have uh, tabled in some teasers, uh, teasing questions that uh, national counterparts will, will want to consider or may want to consider as we work through the building up process to, to help you in addressing the addressing standards as a tool or as a mechanism in your HCFC implementation processes. So in our analysis, there is no one size fits all. It also very much depends on the country. It depends on what is your industry base, your manufacturing base. Are you an importer, exporter? Uh, what kind of technologies are uh, being used uh, locally, whether it be manufactured for export or imported for specific purposes? And, of course, what is your national status and the, on the subject of standards? And uh, link, of course, with uh, any codes that is related to that are related to to the subject. And again, there is no set mechanism. There is no set procedure. Each is a, a country-specific situation, and how you address and what are your needs in addressing this uh, specific area of of requirements now in your ATSC phase-out management system. Now. In the, in the interest of time, uh, as we had our last meeting in Australia for the region of Asia Pacific, and we did a small questionnaire. Now, this is not uh, scientifically tested. It did not go through the scientific processes of questionnaireing. But we did a, a in, informal circle around our participants on what is their national situation in, in the business of standards or addressing standards. And for us, uh, from the, the results we got back, uh, uh, this chart to me is extremely um, uh, informative on, on really how much work we have to do at the national level to, to bring into form and to bring into some sort of addressing your APFC uh, management processes. And, and from this, if you look at the, for example, um, the first one, which was the, the 7 percent, official national and international rules are already in place. So this is a, this is a survey of about 22 countries, and, and really just about one out of that 22 says that there was enough uh, there was official national or international rules at the national level to support the HCC phase out. So therefore, on the others, there's always each point gives an indication that something more had to be happening. And the largest uh, piece of the pie, which is 39%, as you would see in the cream color, said that we do not have any rules to respect the use of low GWP alternatives as they work towards the implementation of the phase-out mechanism in, uh, for ATSCs. So, uh, this is a call that we have right now uh, facing us as countries, and uh, it's, it's urgent and indicative that uh, the work has to start at this point in time. We have to start the work now. So uh, with this uh, understanding, so what could be some of the suggested roles of our national rules and officers and other national counterparts in setting standards to help in your ACC phase out? What we can recommend is that you need, as, as national counterparts, you need to know what your national situation is. You need to prepare your road map and, of course, to know where you are now and then what you need to start. Uh, from the work we have done so far and going back to the pie chart, you would see that uh, one of the key issues on capacity building 
in the, in the capacity building, we need to ensure that there is appropriate capacity to adapt to international standards with respect to refrigerants and the home sector. So we need also to catalyze and coordinate. We need to bring all your stakeholders together, both from the public and the private sector. And for the Article 5 countries with HCFC management plan, we will suggest that you, again, work with your respective implementing agency, that's the Montreal Protocol implementing agency, to see what, what can be offered under your present management and processes for HCC. And, of course, promoting awareness raising in all sectors, including the general public. Now, I say the general public, uh, and... and this is approaching, as I said, where the, the urgency of such is. Because we saw in, in some countries, for example, uh, in the, especially in the, the Pacific Islands, where I'm primarily responsible for, we are seeing all, already that the hydrocarbon refrigerators are coming into the market. They are coming in uh, already as installed systems. And the public is not aware of it. The public will just go to the hardware or to the to the chain and buy a refrigerator, not knowing that in that refrigerator, the refrigerant contain is hydrocarbon. And so therefore it brings into another realm of, of requirement is the, the servicing of these hydrocarbon systems that are already entering uh, the main market, the consumer market, and how aware are our consumers in addressing this uh, technology that is already on your local shelf. And uh, we we will suggest that the national counterparts, of course, need more engaged in the development of this subject, both at the national as well as the international level. Now, in conclusion, coming out of the seminar that we did in uh, May of uh, this year in, in Australia, we did a national uh, international symposium on the subject of standards, and we understood very much how complicated the subject is. The recommendations coming out of this session is that we, we need to bring the awareness to the public and particularly our national officers who have uh, to engage in this uh, um, responsibility as you address your ACC phase out. So therefore, um, as I close, uh, I would like to highlight that we will continue with uh, these webinar air sessions. Uh, we have identified some other subject areas that we would want to engage in through webinar session. But please, uh, if you feel that you have uh, any other suggestion that would be uh, necessary for you and, of course, uh, in with your counterpart to bring the subject into, into the fore and to the, into the common knowledge base, uh, through the webinar session, we would be very happy to to accommodate your request. So I take it back to our moderator, Shamila. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arti, for um, your for introducing the webinar topic and for all the details. And uh, now I would like to invite our next presenter, Mr. Kevin Lee. Thank you. Mr. Lee yeah. is the Global Technical Manager for Heatcraft Worldwide Refrigeration and Chairman of Australian Standards Committee and Australia's representative to the International Organization for Standardization for Refrigeration Safety and Environment. Uh, Kevin will talk about the harmonization and nationalization of standards. Kevin, we are listening to you. Okay. Thank you, Samira, for that introduction. Um, yeah, as Samira said, my topic is harmonisation and nationalisation of standards. But before I go on to that, we need to have firmly in our mind what are the issues that the HCFC alternatives bring to the table. So if we talk about the characteristics of low GWP, it means that we're either dealing with much higher pressures, such as with um, carbon dioxide, or we're dealing with toxicity issues, um, the worst of these being with ammonia. And ammonia has been used as a refrigerant for a very long time, quite successfully. But even 
carbon dioxide, which is listed as a non-toxic refrigerant, carbon dioxide itself, if it leaks into a space where there's human habitation, it can be fatal above 5%. And that's not because of oxygen depredation. That's because carbon dioxide itself can sensitise the heart. Um, you'll pass out and become unconscious. And if you're not removed from that area, you, you can die. And then, of course, the third big issue is... Uh, Mr. Lee, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are not able to see your presentation. Okay, sorry. Yes. Um, share my desktop. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, hopefully Please you can see it. my... Yes, can you see now, my yes, now we can see it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for uh, interrupting. Oh, I appreciate it. Okay, and the, the last big grouping here is flammability, um, which can be broken into two groups. Those refrigerants of a high flammability, such as butane, which is R600, and propane, which is R290. So these are commonly called your natural refrigerants being hydrocarbons. Then we have a, a new group of refrigerants which are mildly flammable. And this is R32, which will be used in air conditioning. And the new HFO refrigerants, 1, 2, 3, 4, YF and ZE. So, this is what we need standards and regulations to address into the future when we replace um, refrigerants such as R22. And you know, to ensure safety, we will need some degree of regulatory control. So a regulatory system to adopt HCFC alternatives, um, this system will need to cover in all these developing countries, the importation and supply of refrigerant itself. It needs to cover issues such as the type of cylinders, the storage and the transportation requirements. Then you will have product certification of the refrigerant itself and then the refrigeration systems. Um, if you've got a highly flammable refrigerant in a system, will you need to look at should that system be certified? Should it be approved through some sort of approval process? You'll need licensing and training of the technicians themselves to install and service these systems. And then to do that licensing and training, you'll need something to underpin it. And one of the tools there is standards. And of course, we need to guard against counterfeiting of refrigerant and mislabeling of refrigerant and systems. And again, this is where we need standards for the purity of refrigerants. And of course, the major issue here is safety, and that is both in the workplace and for the end consumer where the refrigeration or air conditioning system is being installed. So we need this regulatory system to sort of look at all these different issues. Now the role of standards in that regulatory environment is that a standard will state the minimum requirements of compliance for safety and environmental issues. Now, I've heard people say that standards are best practice, but that's not really the case. Standards are usually around the thing of stipulating or stating what is the minimum requirements that you must do to make that product safe. You can do a lot more and add additional things to it, The a standard will usually set the minimum requirements. And then that standard can be used as an instrument in regulations. And as an example, in Australia and New Zealand, we've called up some specific standards in our ozone and synthetic greenhouse gas regulations. We also have standards called up in our electrical safety regulations. And this is particularly pertinent when you come to flammable refrigerants and you have the risk of an electrical component igniting any leaked refrigerant. Then we also have standards called up in our workplace and occupational health and safety regulations. And this is for hazardous areas, whether it be a toxic refrigerant or a flammable refrigerant or under very high pressure and there's explosion risk. And in Europe, for example, standards aren't mandatory and they aren't called up exactly in regulations 
that they are a pathway or a means of showing compliance. So in Europe, you have European directives, and a harmonised standard is one pathway you can use, or a manufacturer can use, to show that he's complied with the requirements of that directive, whether it's a safety directive or an environmental directive. And of course, where standards really come in is that a key role of standards is to facilitate free trade. It's, and this is where global harmonisation of standards is absolutely critical. And what we cannot have is countries setting up standards just at purely the national level and then those standards becoming a trade barrier. Now that might in some cases be intentional, but in a lot of cases it's unintentional. In other words, a country may decide that we need to modify a standard or develop our own standard because the international one is not appropriate. And that's where we all need to get involved in the development of international standards to make sure that they are appropriate. Now, the standards development process itself. In the past, the focus was primarily on safety. But the current focus has changed. Now we find that in standards, environmental aspects are increasingly included. And I've got two items here in red. And the first of these is that we've got to strive to achieve the best balance between safety, both for the worker and the consumer who's using the product, and the safety of the environment. So there's, it comes down to a personal safety level and, and the safety of the environment for the whole globe. So we've got to achieve the best balance between those two. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, this is a compromise. We can't always have the best environmental outcome if we put too many lives at risk with the refrigerant we're using. There's also a focus now on energy efficiency. And certainly when we talk about selecting a refrigerant and using refrigerants that have a low global warming potential, that is no good if they're not very energy efficient because at the end of the day you still emit global warming gases in generating electricity. And of course here a big focus at the moment is on the harmonisation of standards. And we haven't got there yet but currently work is undergoing and is starting to develop where we are developing standards to get the right balance of global warming potential and efficiency. And this is termed as the life cycle um, performance. Now, standardisation bodies, you have international bodies such as the International Standards Organisation and the IEC, which is the International Electricity Commission. And from that, underneath that, you'll have European standards bodies such as CEN and CENELEC, and then we come down to the national bodies. And I've got up here um, Standards of Australia, um, the Standardisation Administration Body for China, um, there's the Japanese Standards Association. And below that we have industry standards. And then in our industry we do have a couple of very important bodies there, such as the AHRI um, and ASHRAE, where those, those two organisations have developed some standards which are in turn used by national standards and international standards. So all these bodies link together. And ISO typically develops standards which we call horizontal standards. These are general standards that go across many different groups of refrigeration or air conditioning products. The IEC, by contrast, develops what we call vertical standards. These are product-specific standards, and they might apply to an air conditioner or a refrigerator or a washing machine or something like that. Now, standards also work in a hierarchy. And RI700 and ISO817, these two standards, one is an industry standard and one is a international standard, both these standards give very basic refrigerant safety data. And these standards are used in turn by ISO 5149. Now ISO 5149, this is a general and overall 
system safety standard that covers environmental aspects and, and safety. It's an ISO standard, so it covers a whole broad suite of different products. And above that, we have, as an example here, the IEC 60335 series of standards. These are product-specific standards covering safety issues, and now they're starting to bring in environmental issues. We can have um, this particular set of standards refer to ISO 5149 for general refrigeration safety issues, um, and they're often mandatory as, mand as national adoptions. So these compliance with a 60335 standards, for example, is mandatory in Australia under our electrical regulations. And in the in Europe, they're one of the harmonised pathways to prove compliance at the national level. And here I've got up the symbol for Standards Australia and also Standards New Zealand. Now in the past, if I go back 15, 20 years ago, standards were written at the national level. And they're primarily written by industry through technical experts. So country specific and they weren't harmonised with other countries or international. And there was very limited government or regulatory involvement in the development of those standards. We've seen a big shift and currently standards written at the, are written more at the international level by industry experts in working groups. Those standards are then reviewed and voted on at the ISO or IEC committee level by member countries. So in other words, a refrigeration standard will go up to an ISO technical committee after it's been written and it will be reviewed by all the member countries that are participating in that particular ISO standards committee. Once it's approved, those standards can then be adopted nationally with minimal changes. And this means that there's increased government and regulatory involvement. So you find that the national level, the, the national committee becomes more of a review committee to make sure that the different areas of concern between safety, the environment and the industry are working together. Now as an example of this, the Standards Committee ME006 is a Refrigerant Safety and Environment Standards Committee. It's a joint committee between Australia and New Zealand. I chair that particular committee in Australia and New Zealand, and I'm also that committee's delegate to the international standard that covers refrigeration safety. And our committee members in Australia and New Zealand, we have the environmental departments and the regulators represented, so there's three representatives from there. We have occupational work, health and safety represented, and we have fire and emergency services represented. Then we have our industry experts, and we have 10 industry experts from all segments of the industry, represented through industry associations. Then we have end users represented, and in this case it's the retailers, such as the supermarkets or the convenience stores and also refrigerated railways are represented. We have some representation from the natural refrigerant groups. LPG Australia represents hydrocarbons and the Green Cooling Association. They have a representative there that is looking at carbon dioxide or ammonia and also um, hydrocarbons. And lastly we have two representatives from Standards Australia and also Standards New Zealand. So a very broad group of representatives here from all the stakeholders involved. And an important thing here is this Standards Committee is not worked on a strict voting process. In other words, when you look at an issue, you don't say, well, 60% of the people agree, 40% of the people don't agree, therefore it is passed. We work on a consensus process and that means that the greater majority of the people must agree. And if we have one or two dissensions, we then must work to, 
to get them agree as well, which can be quite a lengthy process, but it means we have bots, just on my presentation here, standards are getting more complex. And unfortunately, we cannot avoid this, because as we need to balance safety and environmental needs, it, it is going to require more complex standards. And the standards now, we need to cover toxic refrigerants, um, flammable refrigerants and high pressure refrigerants. So it, it means we're going to have more complex standards. And as a result of that, we, we need to face up that we've got to upskill the industry because of these issues I've just named. So I talked to all the developing countries here that when you look at how you're going to introduce standards, um, you need to look at having a national standards committee itself whether that's formal or whether it's informal, made up of broad representation. And what I found here in Australia and New Zealand is that this broad representation, it then promotes interaction between the regulators themselves and industry. So that a safety regulator gets to understand some of the issues faced by an environmental regulator. An environmental regulator understands some of the safety issues. And it's, it's very good when you get the regulators understanding different areas and it helps to really get a good understanding and a resolution of conflicting issues because we do have conflicting issues between safety, the environment and commercial needs. So thank you for your attention and I'll pass you back to our host, Samir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee, for uh, the comprehensive information and for your presentation. And I would like now to invite our next presenter, Mr. Samir Trabulsi. Uh, Samir is the Chairman and General Manager of Thermo Trade FAL and the Managing Directions, but we are not uh, hearing the sound. One second, please. Um, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Uh, I said thank you, Samira, for uh, the presentation, for presenting me as well as for organizing this, organiz uh, this webinar meeting. Thanks for all the participants, colleagues, and here I go. Uh, I was asked to, to uh, uh, work on a topic which is very important for many developing countries, uh, especially in particularly uh, Article 5 countries. And in this presentation, I'd like to go through we use refrigerants in Iraq in refrigeration and air conditioning systems, and now we can add the heating system as well. Why uh, we have moved from, or trying hardly to move entirely from non-ODS alternatives into, from ODS into non-alternative alternatives, especially in developing countries where we have seen developed countries have moved much earlier than us. And then I'm going to present actually position statements on refrigerants as well as uh, the standards we're part of uh, on refrigerants. Last uh, couple of slides we talk about certain barriers and hence how to move forward from that. Prior to introduction, what is a refrigerant? In thermodynamics refrigeration process, we need a certain uh, fluid that will handle the process by, absorb, by allowing air or water to absorb or any other media to absorb the heat and discharge it into the atmosphere. So this fluid is contained in a closed cycle. And unfortunately, leakage happen, accidents happen, and hence we are concerned with the leakage of such refrigerants when it happens. So, refrigerants are needed for creating a refrigeration thermodynamic process. And, uh, we have seen in the last, I would say, even since the 70s, an increase in the need for uh, air conditioning equipment, which is a reflection of higher GDP. People would like to have more comfort. So, accordingly, more number of units being uh, sold, sold, and then maintained uh, properly or improperly, ending up with a lot of emissions. Now, it was 
the first step of Montreal Protocol to fail the use of CFCs, and it did very well over a certain number of years in many countries, in most the countries. And uh, then we moved into another issue, which is at CFC. And uh, now we are in the move to, uh, uh, to entirely cap or uh, stop using at CFC by the year 2030. However, during this process of moving from CFC to FCFC, FCFC uh, certain uh, reservation uh, systems were moving into something called HFCs, and over the time we found out that we ended up with an issue called ozone depletion layers, and we ended up with another problem which could be considered as global warming with its, uh, uh, what happened, scientists, uh, engineers were faced with such a problem. We need to move from one use of a certain refrigerant into another and suddenly you are faced with complications. Maybe because of the technology you are not, you are not aware at the very beginning that this could create certain implications, but now everyone is aware that yes, we, are, we want to use a refrigerant that is very friendly with the environment, that is safe to use, that is uh, not flammable. As an engineering profession, we care about the uh, life of public, we care about the health, and we care about the welfare. And adding this, a fourth dimension came since the 70s, which is environment. So we need to seek for a refrigerant that has these all characteristics. Now, uh, moving uh, uh, from, from CFC into HCFC, we're, we're moving, uh, I think, in various countries, but we need to have an idea why the developed countries have managed to have an earlier, uh, uh, let's say, phase out use of HCFC and why the developing countries, they will be striving until the 2030 to end up using HCFC. Most likely, it would be because of lack of uh, let's say, a lack of standards or know-how, how to make it. On the other area, like in Europe, in developing countries, in developed countries in the North America, they have initiated something called international standards. Some of them, like, named like IS, uh, ISO, ASRI, ASRI, and other uh, uh, international organizations. And... Uh, most of them will focus or have focused on safety and being applicable into their own climate conditions or environmental conditions. When we try to take these standards into different countries, we may be faced with issues like certain uh, countries, they may have high ambient conditions, they may not be familiar or they have developed, maybe did not take into consideration such high uh, 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 environmental conditions. So that means that once we develop a standard, it doesn't mean that it can be taken and uh, copied and paste in a certain country and say, yes, uh, this should work. Uh, in order to move from the uh, uh, ODS into non-ODS and hence now into a low uh, global warming potential, any alternative will go into a process of uh, uh, identifying the capital cost, operating cost, and then how, what would be the implication on the refrigeration system as far as equipment size concerned, the operating cost, the qualification of people who are going to handle the new refrigerant, and also stakeholders. Stakeholders should be educated, should be aware of the new refrigerant and whether it will be acceptable to them financially uh, and uh, whether safety is also guaranteed in that case. Our current use of non-ODS definitely is much less than the ODS and this is well, under, uh, well clear. Why? Because the shift cannot be done. I mean, people were, were using uh, ODS for o over the years and then they became uh, attached to them, and then suddenly we come to them and say, well, these are no more friendly, we need to get rid of them. The process, transition process, will take a bit longer time, and this is what's happening actually in the HCFC at this stage. 
The new refrigerant we're looking at definitely shall be used in all the equipment, in all the systems related to refrigeration, air conditioning, and heating. Ray has developed three position statements, and these position statements are revisited every uh, three years. It has an expiry period. The safety, uh, the, the uh, position statement has to be visited every every uh, three years, as well as a standard. We have a cash rate standard. One of them is standard 15, which is the safety standard for refrigeration systems, and one of them is 34, which is designation and safety classification of refrigerants. In addition, we are concerned on the safety and as well as on the energy efficiency, corporate social responsibility today. So the aim of doing a certain position statement is to let the stakeholders be aware of the importance of handling a viable refrigerant that will be accepted within a certain country. That, that these standards are supposed to be uh, similar to the international equivalent like ISO 5149 or ISO 817, but uh, going back into the position by actually, we can see on this slide how uh, stakeholders or end users move from CFC to transitionally to the SCFC, and that could be considered a a, a, a pitfall from the day starting with CFC. We shifted everyone to use into the SCFC because of the easy change. You can have a kit at the time to move from CFC into SCFC without the need of changing the refrigeration system. But what happened is, uh, uh, and users move into SCFC, and now we're going back to them and say, hey, SCFC is no good for you. Let's, let's move into natural refrigerant or uh, HF foods. Now, of course, some move into HFCs, and we have seen what happened in regards to global warming issue and what would be the need for now of uh, asking people to move into uh, either natural refrigerant or ultimately the HF in the future. So, uh, 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 position statement, refrigerant and their responsible use, it will expire 2015. This is after being renewed a couple of times. It discusses the chemical stability, the health and safety issues, and the performance of systems of various refrigerants. The second position statement talks about natural refrigerant. It's a call of asking people to move into natural refrigerant. Uh, mainly, we talk about ammonia or, or R717. Uh, it's an uh, ideal uh, refrigerant, but unfortunately, it doesn't come for, uh, without uh, certain issues, conflicting issues of safety and other uh, uh, maintenance uh, or plant design problems. However, for every 50 kilos, just to let, uh, have an idea of what's okay, about here, 50 kilograms of ammonia can produce up to 1,000 kilowatt cooling. The second reason I discussed what we have right now, it's uh, carbon dioxide, R744. Also, it's, uh, it's having sort of low toxicity, irrespective of what. I mean, we use also CO2 in suppression fire fight, fire in generators room, for example, and it's suffocating, of course, when it goes beyond certain concentration. So, uh, also, uh, a refrigerant is valuable in certain aspects, but unfortunately, it may have conflicting uh, issues related to it. Uh, carbon dioxide also a issue of high pressure requirement that would mean more cost and uh, more safety issues. Comparison between the energy needed for generating certain quantity, rectifying certain quantity of CO2 would be one kilogram uh, of CO2 per uh, kilogram of uh, the refrigerant. Uh, if it were for ammonia, it would be two. And if it were for the fluorocarbon, it would be nine. So by, by, by comparison, then definitely CO2 is good in this particular aspect. However, this is not the only aspect we need to worry about. A refrigerant, again, we have hydrocarbons. Uh, uh, apart from their uh, safety issue, they are also getting uh, acceptance in uh, refrigeration products 
they can be used even in high uh, in refrigeration uh, as to as much as low temperature as possible. Sulfur could be considered as a natural refrigerant, but unfortunately, it's not that uh, simple to use water uh, because of the low coefficient of performance. We can use it with the uh, aid of heating chromite in certain opportunities. Air can be also considered as uh, a refrigerant, but uh, it would be an issue in the uh, efficiency and pressure uh, conditions. Uh, on the natural uh, refrigerants, uh, that the position statement actually is committed to the application of natural refrigerants. That means this society, technical society, will be willing to uh, look for uh, more applications in natural refrigerants and awareness and dissemination of information worldwide, publication of technical information is ongoing, and this is the interest of this technical organization to promote natural refrigeration. The position statement, go quickly through, uh, it's, it's ammonia. You know, ammonia is uh, uh, the ancient uh, refrigerant as of 1840, 1850 being used. Unfortunately, again, as I said earlier, uh, a refrigerant would be found in certain aspects. It would not be when it comes to exposure with certain uh, concentration. Apart from this uh, 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 position statement, we have two standards. One is called standard 34 and one is 15 and 34. The standard 15 it talks about safety standard for refrigeration systems. It applies for, uh, for, a, for the design and installation for an operation of any refrigeration site. It, it, it defines various systems, uh, uh, engineering uh, refrigeration systems, the refrigeration according to uh, probability of uh, leak. Uh, it states uh, what sort of uh, safety purpose or safety, requir safety requirement and classification. It will have certain restriction on the use of certain flammable uh, refrigeration refrigerants, especially in areas where we have people moving around. And, uh, uh, and the other uh, uh, standard is uh, uh, also the same standard. It restricts the installation in certain area. We'll tell you what sort of uh, uh, technical requirement needed for access or inspection or type, type of piping and machinery, machine uh, plant room location. It describes also the various components, the maximum pressure design, the pressure vessel, and the various uh, components of the refrigeration uh, that, that you intend to use as the this standard. Using this standard, uh, it will also take you afterwards into installation and hence filter. It contains several normative appendices. Uh, it will provide all various uh, uh, calculation for the discharge of uh, uh, certain compressor, pressure release devices, and other components of the system. Well, on the other hand, we have another standard which is 34 from 10, and it has to do with the designation and safety classification. It became like a sort of reference for individual uh, uh, refrigerant and uh, to identify it. Rather than using the formula or trade, but just specifying it under a certain uh, This standard uh, is being, uh, uh, it, it will be uh, the uh, address in 2013 this year. And as Kevin mentioned before, it's not a standalone issue. You don't issue a standard and you uh, end with it. You need to revisit every three years, depending upon the type of standard make certain changes sometimes, improve on it, and it would be, again, a consensus project. So, the uh, I can see today for developing uh, uh, countries or Article 5 countries, again, uh, technical information uh, on their level as well as on the scientific uh, level, on, on, the, on the researchers, on the innovators to come up with a safe Refrigerant. Uh, uh, 
sometimes uh, is found via the refrigerant may not be available in a certain territory, in a certain country. The cost could be prohibitive sometimes. Uh, uh, people may not have the willing to address a new refrigerant just like this. You need to educate them, take them along the path to, to identify why we're we moving from one refrigerant into another. And that would be uh, oh, uh, that would be overcome by uh, training and uh, uh, dissemination of information. Lack of or availability of standards could be another issue. There could be some resentment from making a change from one into another, and uh, those all of these factors could be addressed if, if we have the right uh, process of developing a standard and moving our regulations for a code at a later stage. We should we look for having in each national country certain definition of their regulatory uh, infrastructure or what they have as regulations, and uh, uh, with more awareness campaigns, uh, either, uh, exploring or ex disseminating the information about international standards available in certain countries and taking them into their countries. Uh, training, guidance, of course, and uh, all of these would require definitely financial investment. During these years, maybe uh, countries are facing certain financial impacts, financial I don't know, crisis, but that would definitely deter or delay the movement in the above four uh, uh, items. What will be our future? Well, I think so thank you for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zabosi, uh, for all the information and the thorough details uh, about the roadmap for the adoption of HDSC alternatives in the refrigeration and air conditioning. And uh, before we move to our next presenter, uh, let me remind the participants uh, if they have any questions that they would like to address to our uh, today's uh, panelists, uh, please feel free to do so. You can type your messages into the chat box that is at the bottom of uh, your screen to the right side, and we are happy to address your questions to the experts uh, after our last presentation. Um, now I would like to invite Mr. Zifeng Chong. Mr. Defang will talk about the new progress on the standards adopting low GWP flammable refrigerants. Mr. Defang, we are listening to you. Uh, it's my great honor that uh, you have uh, invite, uh, invite us to introduce the standards on flammable refrigerants in China. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, in China, for the refrigeration and the air conditioning sectors, we usually we divide this sector into two subsectors. The first one is the uh, room air conditioners, uh, like the uh, uh, resident, residential air conditioners, and uh, the other one is the industrial and the commercial refrigeration sector, uh, usually. Uh, the bigger uh, air conditioners and the refrigeration systems. Uh, for the first stage of the excess PC south, uh, we choose the 290 uh, property as the main alternative in the room air conditioner sector, and uh, we choose 32 and other uh, substances uh, as the uh, main alternatives in the industrial and commercial refrigeration sector. And uh, we all know that the uh, 290, R290 is a flammable gas, and the 32, although it is uh, uh, A2L uh, level flammable gas, but still it is flammable. So <coughs> according to the uh, standards in China, we have to pay attention to the standards, uh, especially on the safety and also on the uh, energy efficiency, on the production, uh, the up and the uh, 
the installation, maintenance, and the storage and transportation. And in the room air conditioning sector, actually, we already have the uh, safety uh, and safety and design um, standard. We call it DB four seven zero six dot three two. Uh, it is the same as the IEC six zero uh three five two forty and uh actually it's only the translation of this IEC standard. And uh, this standard was approved in uh, twenty twelve and uh, uh, was effective from May of this year. And also for the room air conditioner productions we have to follow the uh, energy efficiency standards. Uh, uh, and uh, for this energy efficiency standard, it is uh, fine with uh, uh, the 290 restaurant because for energy efficiency standard, a, a, this standard uh, does not care which kind of, air, uh, which kind of restaurant you will use. Uh, this standard only cares about the uh, uh, energy efficiency at the production, and also for others, for example, for the production lines, because you know 290 is the flammable gas, so we have some uh, safety requirements for the production lines. Uh, but in China, we don't have the storage and the transportation, also the maintenance of the uh, 290 room air conditioners. Uh, uh, for the installation, we already uh, standard, but this standard only uh, I mean, rules how to install the uh, refri uh, uh, install the room air conditioners with uh, unflammable gases like 22, like 48. So we can see that uh, for the room air conditioner sector, uh, actually we already have the safety and design. Mm, standard already have the energy efficiency. Uh, for the next step, uh, actually China is already trying to uh, draft and uh, uh, finalize the standard on the uh, production lines, on the storage and transportation, and also on the installation and the maintenance. For the industrial and the commercial refrigeration uh, sector, uh, we have this GB9237 uh, standard. Actually, it's also almost the same as ISO 5149. Uh, but in this standard, flammable are not allowed. It is very clearly. So, which means that 32 is not allowed to use as the refrigerant in uh, this standard. Uh, and also, we uh, accept for the safety, we also have some, uh, because in the, in the industrial and commercial refrigeration uh, sector, there are a lot of um, different kinds of productions. So we have some special requirements on the production and also on the key components uh, design, like the com uh, compressor. Also, we have the energy efficiency standard and the production line standard. <laughs> For the industrial and the commercial refrigeration sector, uh, actually, because you know, ISO 5149 uh, uh, is now trying to revise, trying to be uh, review and revise, but still there is no conclusion now. Uh, so we have to uh, be very careful uh, trying to uh, either follow the revised ISO standard or we have to go back uh, to revise the national standard TB uh, 9237 by ourselves. Uh, for the special requirements on production, um, because you know, also they don't have any, uh, I mean, uh, any rules on the flammable gases, on the flammable refrigerant. So we have to also revise them. <coughs> uh, 
here is a very important suggestion uh, from outside. We suggest that the risk assessment on the usage of the uh, flammable gases should be done first before you try to do any uh, revise of your standard. Uh, because you know, uh, in China we already finished the uh, risk assessment on the uh, 290 room air conditioning production, but only the usage of this uh, kind of production. Uh, we found it is very useful because the risk assessment shows uh, the risk level, and uh, this will help us to decide if it is uh, uh, acceptable. For example, uh, for our uh, manufacturers, they think that uh, uh, the risk of the um, manufacture of the 290 production is controllable, is acceptable, but the risk for the maintenance, for the aftercare is maybe not very good, not uh, 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 very good for them, and they are still uh, trying to do something more to reduce the risk level. And also the assessment will show where the risk occurs and uh, then we can do something more to reduce the uh, risk level. We can do something more to for the revisement or the draft of the uh, standards. Uh, as you know, we already finished the risk assessment on 290, and uh, now we are doing some risk assessment on uh, 32. And also, we already uh, share uh, the uh, risk assessment results in the chapter. So, and uh, now the, our manufacturers are trying to do more to uh, reduce, as I told you, reduce the uh, risk level and also to see if it is acceptable for them to promote such kind of production into the market. Uh, for the barriers, first, uh, although the IEC standard accepts the hydrocarbon, like the 290, but it is too strict, uh, especially for the charging amount which means that uh, if we follow the charging amount, we have to cut the production, um, we will not have the best energy efficiency. So this is a big issue for the manufacturers. And uh, for the ISO standards, still now um, this standard say no to all the flammable refrigerants. And, uh, uh, as I introduced, we in the industrial and the commercial refrigeration sector in China, we follow this standard, which means that actually we cannot sell any production with 32 now in China. Uh, and then in China, we also have some certification on the productions. Any production should pass this triple C certification. So this is the uh, certification by the uh, by China before the production can be sold in the market. And actually, for the uh, certification institution, this is also the first time for them to do some certification on the flammable uh, gas regulation. So. We are now still, uh, we are now uh, trying to uh, work work with them to, how to say, to move all the barriers for the certificates. And also, uh, even we have the standards which allows the uh, usage of the flammable gas, of the low GWP refrigerant. Uh, we have to make sure that the standards can be followed strictly, especially for the installation and the maintenance, because according to our research, uh, 
and uh, also according to the research from other uh, countries, from other institutions, uh, the installation and the maintenance, uh, at the risk of the installation and the maintenance is higher than the usage, uh, than the manufacturing, than the uh, storage, and also than the uh, transportation. So this is uh, uh, my presentation. Again, it's our great honor to be invited to uh, in the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dufang, uh, for uh, the presentation and for all the details. And now uh, I would like to open the floor for question and answer from the audience, from the participants. So please, uh, if you have a question to the panelists, uh, you can type it into the chat box and uh, we are happy to extend your questions. So um, before we start the question and answer, I would like now to turn to Ms. Dubry. Uh, I think, would you like to have a comment or would you like to open the question and answer? Okay, uh, thank you, Samira, and thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, excellent presentation, and uh, uh, again, in your presentation, what came out very, very strong is the, the mammoth task that we all have uh, in front of us at the national and international level in bringing this subject into functionality uh, and integrated into the obligations of parties as you address your ATSC phase-out management obligation. So thank you again. Uh, Samira, I would go with your recommendation that we open the floor for questions. Over to you. Thank you. So, Arti, uh, we have received uh, so far a uh, few questions. Let me read the uh, one uh, received from Ms. Dominique Todin. Um, so, uh, do all keynote speakers agree that the uh, ISO and IEC standards route should be preferred over any national, country-specific initiative in order to ensure free trade or RAC system? Uh, Mr. Lee, would you like to respond to this question? Thank you. Um, yeah, I see it as absolutely critical that we use ISO standards or IEC standards and we don't have countries developing their own standards which are unique to that country. Um, it is a condition of the WTO as far as free trade that standards aren't used or seen to be used as a trade barrier. But there are some countries countries that do have very particular issues and one in particular is the Middle East with their very high ambience there where they have ambience over 50 degrees C and I will admit that ISO and IEC in developing their standards haven't taken some of the climatic conditions into consideration in the standards themselves for countries like um, Saudi Arabia and these Middle East countries and they have some particular issues right now in trying to phase out R22 in that a lot of the new refrigerants don't perform very well at very high ambience. So when we develop international standards, we really have to look closely at a full climatic range right around the world. You know, we've tended to concentrate too much on the climate conditions in the developed world. But certainly we need to work towards international standards. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Mr. Trabulsi, would you like to uh, add uh, uh, about this question? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been having the experience when we take certain standards to a certain territory. It's not that easy to bring the standard and put it on the uh, place uh, when the stakeholders of that particular place are not aware or they may have bit changing or different, uh, as mentioned now, climatic uh, conditions or different way of looking at the subject in total. 
The aim behind preparation of standards, international standards, is to put it as a platform for any national country to take it and see how they can build their own based on such available information. In a country like Lebanon, for example, we have several standards coming on the certain subject from different countries. So we cannot go pro one and forget about the others. What we usually do around here is to ask the stakeholders to come forward and pick all these standards and see which one can be applied, which one has to be modified, because you need to know that uh, the standard, even prepared as an international standard, it was, not, it was not prepared today for implementing it today. It was prepared several years ago, and every three years or four years they go and revisit the same standard. So, accordingly, a standard cannot be taken as a document and being put on a table on a certain country and say, hey, this is the right standard for you. The people there should look at this standard and evaluate whether it really serves their uh, in, uh, uh, objective behind implementing uh, the purpose of such a standard. So I would say, yes, it would be fine to look at international standards, and this is the aim of this webinar today, but we should also give the national country the opportunity to see how other countries, developed countries, look at their environment, at their uh, use of refrigerant, and then they decide on a, a, a suitable uh, refrigerant that will suit. As I said earlier, the conflicting parameters they have are costs like adaptability, flammability, risk, and whatever. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the details. I uh, would like to ask now uh, Mr. Dufeng if uh, you would like to add uh, uh, some details about this question uh, uh, according to the experience in China. Yes, actually I totally agree uh, the opinions of uh, Mr. Tovasi and actually also uh, in China uh, for the IC and the ISO standards. Uh, I have to say that we have, uh, for, for every country, uh, it will have different situations. So when we uh, choose the standards, we have to be uh, very, very careful. Uh, because IC or uh, IOC or any other standard doesn't mean that uh, it will meet the requirements of the state stakeholders of every country. Uh, in China, especially for us, uh, we think that uh, IC and IOC standards, uh, we have to consider these kind of standards very carefully, but uh, if we, um, if our stakeholders think something may be not right in China, we have to revise or we have to modify uh, standards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Zifeng. Uh, I think would you like to uh, add uh, something about this question or we can go to the next question? We can move on, Kanida. Thank you. Okay. I received another question from uh, Maruksa Arana. Uh, will the Article 5 countries look more at the European standards or the American standards to develop their own? Um, I think, uh, Mr. Lee, you would like to start, uh, give, give us uh, elements of a response? Okay. Um, that's, that's a good question, and that came up in some five discussions both on the Gold Coast and on Bangkok at the last two meetings that was held at the UNEP. And a lot of that goes back to the history of the country and where some of the allegiances lie. And for, if I can give an example, countries like the Philippines, um, even Taiwan, where there's been linkages back to the US and they work on a 60 hertz voltage supply. So you see some of those countries might gravitate to a US-based standard such as ASHRAE. But other countries are more closely aligned 
in history to Europe. So you'll have some countries gravitating to the European type standard, which might well be an IEC standard or an ISO standard, or even just a national European standard, an EN standard. So I, I can see 85 countries going both ways, either towards a, an American-based standard such as ASHRAE or AHRI, or towards ISO. I think we'll have both situations. But what I should say is that ASHRAE standards and ISO standards are moving much closer into alignment. So ASHRAE 34 and ISO 817 are very, the new additions that are coming out are very closely aligned. And the same as fashion systems, they are moving much closer into alignment as well. So we're seeing less differences now between a US-based standard and the more European ISO-type standards. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Mr. Klaboshi, would you like uh, to add uh, on this question? Uh, yes, in preparing a standard, uh, uh, it, it, it takes into consideration the needs of a certain uh, place. Uh, so it's not fair to say we want to take a uh, certain standard prepared by an organization. Well, it is for international standard, but if it does not cover the various aspects of whether it is weather, uh, or whether it is uh, the, the environment, the safety, the stakeholders, the way of handling, it's if, if you go into a country where courts may be difficult to be implemented, how would you see a possibility for a standard to be taken as well? So, certain countries, they have their own special uh, uh, reasons to adapt a lot certain standards and not to adopt other standards. It may have to do with the culture, it may have to do with the language and the preparation of such standards. So, I, I think we need not to mandate one, one American standard in a national uh, country where it's striving towards the same objective. The objective is to use a system that is viable, that is safe, that is environmental friendly, and hence uh, you may see certain standards of certain different parts of the world overlapping with this particular purpose, and we need to encourage countries to move into this mission, this objective, as respective of that of each country in uh, initiating such standards. Thank you, Mr. Trabosi. Uh, Mr. Zifang, would you like to add um, anything about this question? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think that uh, now we are close to the end of this webinar. So uh, still, if um, we we, ha we have questions from the participants, we can address them uh, by uh, email exchange. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Dupuy, if uh, you would like to summarize. Um, on um, on the topic today. Thank you, Samira. I had one question. Uh, am I allowed to ask it over the over, over this record? Yes, please, please go ahead. Okay. And my question was for Samir. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that, uh, for example, there is the expiration of the ASHRAE standard by 2014. Uh, for example, the R704. And so my question is, uh, can you walk us through what happened after, what will happen after 2014 when the ASHRAE standards are expired? Over. Thank you. Uh, you're talking about the expiry of a position statement, not the standard. Yes. The standard, the standard okay. is revisited okay. automatically every three years, and this is a need by any organization to be assessed with the standard and see if they can post it. Technology in all of time, and we may need to readdress certain uh, clauses in that particular standard. So, the standard is a process that will be continued. That's why I say, if we have a standard 2013, it cannot be taken and 
duck in a country that they have no idea or no clue about any standards. So country 13, it means it was started in the 70s, improved every three years until we reach today with standard 14, or 34, 2010, or 2013, and so on. So this is the standard. The position statement has an expiry date because it reflects the, uh, the policy of the society itself. But what happens usually, like the one we have in one, uh, which is stage 2014. In 2014, the board of directors will meet on the recommendation of the standard of community advisory and come up with a recommendation either to modify certain statements in the position statement or they would say, leave it as it is, and we issue it, and again, it will be for two years or three years, pending the type technology of the uh, content of that particular position statement. Reminding you that I presented three position statements here, but we have about other seven position statements in the society in different countries. So, position statement reflects the, the, the image of the society, how do they look at certain topics that are uh, of interest to various stakeholders, domestic, international, and so on. So the expiry period doesn't mean that at the end we come, unless, unless we come to a day when the content of a position statement is well ad accepted, well approved by all, well uh, uh, implemented by all, then I think the position statement will have no value, and then we, uh, we can uh, remove it from the statement. So uh, it would be to a good situation when such expiry comes. We look forward to expiring all the position statements. That would mean at that time we have new issues to look at, which is very fine. That would be the goal in future. Okay, thank you very much. And so in closing, uh, Samira, can I can I can I summarize now? Yes, please. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for each of our speakers. Uh, thank you for the participants. Uh, thank you for the questions that, that you have uh, given to us. Uh, please uh, feel free to send us uh, any comments, observations, suggestions that you are having. Uh, it's through the Vote um, and Action branch of uh, Montreal Protocol Unit. We are planning to run at least uh, six other sessions on the topic of standards. Our next session will be on looking at the national bodies, institutions, and procedures, including government rules and responsibilities on standard setting. And this will also include the collaboration of national skills and capacity requirements. So from our speakers uh, today, in each one of the presentations, this subject, the need for capacity building, the need for engagement of the stakeholders, and Mr. Kevin Lee mentioned the consensus building. And our last question is whether you should use the European standard or the ASHRAE standard, which is the US-based standard. All of this will be discussed in more detail in the next session, and of course very much focusing on the national mechanisms, particularly with our low volume and very low volume human countries, on how they are to approach this subject. So thank you again, and uh, thank you for taking the time, and I look forward to working with you in the next session, and I pass it over to my good colleague, Samira. Thank you very much, uh, I I would like, um, on behalf of UNEP Ozone Action, to thank the presenters for the excellent presentation and for sharing the information and their expertise. Ms. Aki Dubuis, Mr. Kevin Lee, Mr. Samit Rabulsi, and Mr. Zon Sifang, and all the participants for your time and interest. Also, to inform you that you will receive shortly by email a link to the information related to today's webinar that will shortly be available on Ozone Action website. We wish that you found this new service of interest to you, and as Arti said, we would be interested to receive your feedback to improve our services, including your suggestions for future webinar topics and or potential speakers. Thank you for your time and interest. The webinar ends now.